Okay, it looks like our participation has leveled off. So uh, why don't we get started? Welcome to the, the um, last of uh, the um, official training um, sessions um, for this MET Plus training series. We will have one more session on May 10th, uh, which will be a Q&A session. Um, and uh, I'm putting the, the link to that. Um, in, or can someone else put a link to the um, to the questions, um, the Slido for the questions in the chat um, so that people can be, um, you know, thinking about what questions come up for this um, session as well as others. Um, so basically on the 10th, what we'll do is we'll take all the questions that we've gathered in, in the Slido platform. Um, and if you're interested in the question, go ahead and upvote it. Um, or if, if we're missing a question, go ahead and add your question in there. Um, we'll pull those over to a Google document. Um, we'll add in some, uh, you know, answers and so forth. And then the ones that have the highest votes uh, are the ones that we will tackle in that one-hour time period um, for uh, for the the Q and A session. So, um, switching over to what we're going to talk about today, um, which is the method for object-based diagnostic evaluation mode, and then looking at um, those objects through time (MTD) mode time domain. Um, I'm, I'm going to start off with a fairly um, detailed description of, um, you know, uh, how the objects are identified and, and a lot of the configuration options. Um, we'll run through a short hands-on for mode, um, talk a little bit about mode time domain. Um, Dan, Dan is going to pr provide that in the minute. We'll come back in um, at the end and, and provide a, a couple of um, hands-on for the online tutorial for mode time domain as well. So, um, uh, just to give you a, you know, grounding in, in what we're talking about here, um, we are talking about one of our statistics and diagnostic tools. Um, so in the, the blue stack um, on our wire diagram mode. Uh, basically what we're talking about is trying to transform fields into objects and then be able to objectively measure the attributes of those objects. So if you look over here on the, the left, you'll see a field that is the, um, that is the uh, observed um, precipitation from a particular event. If you look over here on the right, you're actually seeing the probability of uh, a probability forecast of exceeding 12.7 um, um, millimeters, uh, half an inch. Um, and uh, and then if you were to kind of look at um, the the picture in the middle, you can see these objects that were identified from these fields, and those objects. Um, are supposed to, um, you know, zoom in on, on the areas that our eye as a human might also focus in on areas of, you know, heat or, um, you know, uh, colors that, that you um, recognize as something that's important um, to your particular forecast um, users and, and so forth. So um, we're going to turn things into objects and then we're going to measure um, a whole bunch of different attributes about the objects at, as well as um, the pairs between the, the two fields. So um, uh, from Davis et al. 20, 2006, when this was first published, here's um, a diagram of how the objects are identified. Starting in the upper um, left-hand corner, we have um, you know, an original field. In this case, it's precip, precipitation. Um, and the first step is to um, apply a convolution process, or in other words, a smoothing process. Um, to the, the field, um, and the amount of smoothing that is done is user specified. Um, I'll show you in a second. It's called the convolution radius. Um, and in essence, what, you're uh, what we're trying to do is kind of beat down some of the, the higher peaks and, and so forth um, to make it easier to um, pick out these, these objects. Um, and then once you have the, the field convolved, which is in the lower left-hand corner, if you go over to the upper right-hand corner, um, we then apply um, basically a masking um, similar to what we do for uh, other kinds of, you know, regional masking and so forth. It's a zero one bitmap mask um, and it's defined by thresholds that um, once again are user defined. You pick thresholds that are meaningful to, um, to the analysis and, and, um, that you're looking at um, to the users, um, you know, the, that you're trying to uh, provide um, forecast for and, and so forth. Um, and, and once you have, um, once um, mode has identified those um, areas, those objects, through the com, um, convolution and the masking, 
then um, it actually uh, applies that masking region back onto the original field so that you still have um, you know, the original um, values inside those objects. Um, and so that, that gives us an opportunity to not only look at the size of the objects and so forth, but also interrogate the intensity that, is, that are within those objects. So here's an example of what happens if you apply different convolution radii to the same field. Um, and convolution radii um, are usually, um, in other words, the, the radius for smoothing are usually are provided in grids, um, in grid squares or in grid cells, so grid points. Um, so um, you can see the same convective line um, where we have also a, um, a forecast and observed pairs sitting there. Um, you have um, a lot of uh, complexity in the objects if you are um, if you apply uh, a, a convolution of say like three um, grid cells. Um, if you apply nine, um, so a little bit more smoothing to that same convective line, you can see that you lose some of the um, the complexity, but you still keep um, you know some of the the characteristics of you know all the the additional um, you know regions that are are um, you know part of the the um, convective line, and by the time you get to 15 grid squares, um, you can it, the the field has become much more smooth. Um, so it, ultimately, um, it's up to you, um, the person who's setting up mode, to determine how much complexity you want to have in your objects. You know what you're trying to to grasp. Um, if you're looking at um, you know something that's very um, tied to convection or very um, you know, high, um, uh, you know, is, is um, has a lot of um, spatial um, interests that um, that you want to um, to capture in those objects. Then you may want to have um, you know less of a of a smoothing radius, a convolution radius. If you're looking at broader um, uh, items, um, you know, maybe look, just looking at the the general structure of the the band rather than all the the nuances of it, or you just want to to know general areas of, of cloud coverage or, or whatever it is, then you may want to go with these, um, these larger uh, convolution radii. So this is what it looks like in the mode um, configuration file. Um, you know, the example that Minna will run through will show you more of the, the MET plus wrappers around um, the mode configuration file, but I think, um, you know, it's, it's good to also, you know, know what those, um, each one of those flags are, are tied to. So um, in the configuration file, there are, um, you know, this flag, for example, that's called um, quilt. If quilt is equal to false, then um, if you put in multiple convolution radii and threshold, as shown down here, then what it, it does is it, it just matches those up and, and, and processes them basically serially. So it will, um, for the, the convolution radius of five, it will um, use a convolution threshold of greater than or equal to five. Um, for convolution radius of 10, it will use a, um, a threshold of greater than or equal to 15 and so forth. Um, if, you, if you have quilt equal to true, then what it does is it goes through and it, it will um, uh, run through um, the, the, um, the object identification process um, you know, multiple times, actually um, three times for um, convolution radius th um, five, three times for convolution ra radius 10, with all these different thresholds and then three times for convolution radius 15 for all these th different thresholds. So you get nine um, runs of mode rather than um, if quilt equals false, you know, that would only be three. Why would you want to do that? Um, if you like um, to put together what are called quilt plots or heat diagrams, you know, um, uh, with, um, you know, multiple thresholds and, and multiple radii and, and looking at um, a particular attribute um, then, um, you know, this, this provides you the ability to, to develop the, the um, output that you need for that quilt plot. Sensor Thresh, Sensor Val are similar to other tools, basically allows you to fine tune the fields if, if for some, some reason you need to be, um, you know, removing some bad data or changing, you know, some, some um, uh, values that you know um, you don't want included in the, the convolution process. And then I already kind of covered convolution radius and conv convolution threshold and grid, um, radiuses and grid squares. Um, and it can be a list. Um, and then for thresholds, um, you know, pick a meaningful um, thresholds um, to your users. Valid thresh, basically that kind of controls how the edges and bad data are handled. 
basically, if you don't want bad data or edges to be included in, in the convolution process, set that equal to one. Um, by default, it's at um, 0 0.5. So it's um, what it's doing is it's saying that um, as long as 50% of the, the points within that particular radii um, are considered to be um, good data, then it will go ahead and and um, and you know uh, compute um, uh, the the uh, value that should be associated with um, that convolution radius. If it's um, greater than 50% that are, are bad data, then it will just give it a bad data flag. Okay, so then talking about merging and matching, or matching and merging, excuse me. Here's an example of um, you know a forecast field and an observed field. Um, first thing that um, is done, um, as we saw in the previous um, diagram, is you apply a convolution radius. In this case, we chose five because we wanted slightly smoother objects um, and an object threshold of, um, you know, 6.35 millimeters. Um, and, uh, and then um, if you want to, um, if it makes sense to, to have some merging of um, objects together, like for instance, it may make sense to have these two um, objects merge together as one big cluster, or maybe all three of these because of the um, you know the terrain that's associated with it and, and so forth. Um, you can set um, different values to to help with merging. There's two different types of merging. I'll talk about that in a second. In this case, the example we're um, you, uh, demonstrating is what's called double thresholding. So merging occurs um, in this case, you can see that double thresholding may have been a little bit aggressive because I, I'm not sure that it makes sense to have all of these objects merge together, but maybe in your application it does. Um, and same thing here. Um, and, and so um, there's um, actions that are performed on you know, each field individually, like the forecast and the observed or, or the, um, you know, the analysis fields and, and so forth. So once merging is done, then um, the matching between the, the two fields is, is performed. And the matching um, is um, performed using um, a total interest um, ca calculation, which I'll go over in a little bit. Um, so the color coding here indicates that um, in, these, um, in these two fields, um, this object was um, matched. These clusters were matched. Um, there were uh, a couple of objects in the observed field or the analysis field that um, were not matched with anything over um, in the forecast. So in a categorical um, statistic sense, you could consider those to be misses. And then um, once again, thinking in terms of categorical statistics, there were no objects in the forecast field that were um, not matched with observed. So there are no false alarms in this particular field. So here's some of the configure option, configuration options that are important for uh, matching and merging. Um, uh, you know, included in the forecast um, dictionary are a couple of, of different ones that are um, important, including the merge threshold. So that's if you want to do, um, <clears throat> you know, that double merging um, uh, using the, the thresh option, um, and which in this case we have the, the merge flag set to thresh. A good rule of thumb for picking your merge threshold is kind of pick something that's plus or minus 10% um, of the, the value that you have in your threshold. Um, it, for example, if you have um, your, great, your um, thresholding is greater than or equal to, then you might want to pick your double, um, your, uh, double thresholding merge thresh as about 10% less than, than um, the value that you have for that merging. If your um, thresholding is less than or equal to, then you may want to have your, um, you know, thresh your double um, merging threshold um, at about 10% greater than that. So that's just a kind of a good rule of thumb. Um, here, you know, we're, we're highlighting um, all the different flag options, so you can either not have any merging. Um, once again, if you're looking at um, convective type, um, you know, features, you may not want to have any merging at all. You can use the double thresholding. You can use the fuzzy logic engine that, um, once again, I'm going to um, go over in just a second. <clears throat> or you can use a combination of both double thresholding and um, the fuzzy logic engine. To be honest, most people um, uh, apply either none or thresh. Some people apply engine, very few apply both. For matching, so once again, occurring between the two fields, um, uh, we also have, um, you know, a flag a little bit further down in the, um, in the configuration file called match flag. Once again, there are um, several different options. There's um, 
uh, you want to do the matching, but maybe you don't want to do any additional merging um, based on what you're seeing in the two fields. Um, you can do merge both. So what that means is if you are looking, if you have, um, uh, you know, a, a two objects in the forecast field, um, that kind of match up with a, um, an object in the observed field or a cluster in the ob observed field. Um, if you have merged both on, then it would wind up merging those two objects that are in the, the forecast field um, in order to kind of match um, the, the whole characteristic of the, um, the observed and, and the forecast. Similarly, if you had, um, you know, one object or cluster in the forecast field that kind of matches two observed objects, if you have merged both on, then it would merge those observed objects. This is good in some ways, but if you are comparing across multiple models, I would highly recommend that you do not use the merge both option because what you wind up doing then is you wind up changing the observed um, object pattern um, based on what's going on in the forecast. So you're kind of conditioning on forecasts, but that changes the, the observed um, value and that makes it hard to compare across multiple um, forecasts. You could um, consider using merge forecasts, which is um, the, the first example I gave, where maybe there's a couple of different objects um, in the forecast field um, that match with an um, observed object or, or cluster, and you want those to be merged together so that you, you get the best fit between what's in the observed field and, and what's in the, the forecast field. Um, and then you can also um, say that you don't want to do any merging at all. Um, oh, excuse me, and none actually says that you don't want to do any matching. So that's if you want the fields to just kind of stand alone and, and not have the, the um, rest of the total interest field, um, total interest information. Okay, so going into some other configuration options, we have a, a weight option here, which are for the fun, fuzzy engine weights. A good rule of thumb is maybe you want to have values, all those other than the intense percentile value, um, total something like 10 or 100. So that you can kind of think of um, these as percentages of weights that you're, you're applying um, to each one of these attributes that um, come from the, the, um, the uh, matching process. Um, there's also things, um, there's a confidence function and an interest function, and those are defined by kind of giving points of, of the lines um, going from zero to one, um, where one is, is of a lot of interest and zero is of no interest. And then um, giving uh, you know distances um, and, and um, values for it. so for centering distance from zero to fifteen um, grid spacings uh, we're really interested and then after fifteen grid spacings we have a decreasing linearly decreasing interest in the objects up to one hundred and fifty um, uh, grid spacings. Um, this also shows you how you can um, embed. Um, something like a grid resolution um, into the um, into the the central distance. You have some flexibility if you want to always have um, you know 60 as you know the top, the numerator and your grid resolution is changing. Um, so 60 divided by four is 15 clearly, and and so forth. Here's another example for angle difference. So from zero to to one, um, or excuse me, from zero to 30. Um, we're very interested in, um, you know, having those objects um, be matched and say that, yes, they're matching. And from 30 to 90, um, we have a decreasing, linearly decreasing interest in those objects. Okay, so all of that information is um, pulled together into what's called the total interest, um, which is, once again, used primarily for matching, but um, can be used also for merging. Um, alpha are the object attributes, things like centroid distance, axis angle, and boundary distance. Um, W is the scalar weights, so those are these weights here. Um, interest map values is I, so once again, those are, um, you know, this um, information that's um, provided. And then similarly, there is a confidence map value option. I have never heard of a user actually using the confidence, but it's similar to um, interest. It's like, how confident are you of the values that you um, have? Once... Um, once the total interests are computed um, between the two um, uh, fields for each object, then um, it, a total interest threshold is applied to, the, um, to each one of the, the pairs of objects so that um, you know, they can determine whether additional um, uh, metrics um, should be um, computed, the, paired, um, uh, the match paired um, attributes um, between the two objects. 
So right now the default is set to 0 0.7 for that total interest threshold saying yes, anything that has a total interest above 0 0.7, we want all the, um, the paired attributes, um, anything less than that we don't care about. So don't spend time on computing those. If you're struggling with getting your um, objects to, to be considered matched, um, and you feel that you have um, representative um, sca uh, scalars, you know, scalar weights and interest maps and so forth, you may also want to play around with this total interest threshold. Um, maybe put it at 0.6 and see if, the, see if you get the objects matched that you, that you want. The overall approach to how to set up mode um, is try several different com configuration combinations on a diverse set of cases. Um, initially, you know, pick one configuration that works best for, across all these different um, set of cases and then stick with that configuration um, to build up, you know, your database of attributes um, so you can, you can do that systematic evaluation of, of your model. However, um, if you do find that the nature of your fields change by season, it is possible to, you know, maybe have a different um, set of uh, weights and, and, um, and thresholds and so forth. Um, if you have two very distinct seasons, like um, you have a stratiform rain, rain season and a convective rain season or something like that. So you, so you could choose to, you know, um, have two, two or three different kinds of configurations. Okay, so um, I, I'm going to um, cruise through this fairly quickly. There's um, additional stuff uh, at the end of the, the presentation I'm not going to be able to cover. Um, but I do want to talk about the outcome once you get through um, you know, the total in interest threshold, identifying, um, you know, what objects should be uh, matched and, and we want to then move on to computing the, the paired statistics. Here's some examples of paired statistics. So in this field, we have, you know, a, a forecast object that's identified here. And we have a observed object that's identified as well. And we want to know the, um, the centroid distance between um, the, um, this cluster of objects, the green cluster of objects, with the, um, the blue outline cluster of the, the observed um, objects. And so the centroid distance is, you know, kind of the, the, um, the center of that particular um, object. Um, so in this case, the centroid distance is eight grid squares, or um, it being it's a resolution of um, four kilometers, then it's 32 um, kilometers is the um, centroid distance. Another one here's angle difference. Same thing, thinking about that same, um, those same two um, clusters of objects, um, you, you can see that the angle difference here is, uh, you know, maybe um, 30, 30 degrees. Um, if you want to talk about intensity ratio, maybe the, the near peak intensity of the objects inside um, the forecast um, cluster is 48, um, in, if you're talking about re reflectivity, 48 dBZ. And um, inside the, um, the analysis um, cluster, or observed cluster is 47 dBZ. So in this case, the, the ratio between the two is, is pretty good. You know, it's 0 0.99. But say, for instance, um, in, in the analysis cluster, the, you know, the, um, the um, near peak intensity is 55 dBZ. Then you would have a, you know, a different ratio. Um, uh, lower ratio um, for the, the near peak in, um, intensity ratio. And finally, area ratio. Um, this shows you um, that, you know, uh, the cluster for the forecast is much smaller than the cluster that was identified for the, the area, excuse me, for the um, observed. So the area ratio is almost um, 0 0.5, 0 0.53. There's also um, symmetric difference, which is the non-intersecting area, um, you know, kind of here, say for instance, this is the forecast object, and that's the analysis object, the non-intersecting area can be really um, informative. Um, so in this case, the symmetric dis difference, um, there, you know, there's um, some diversity in the, in the um, symmetric difference. But um, the centroid distance actually seems to be fairly, um, you know, well correlated. Um, between all the, the different objects. Um, so um, this is probably the, the, the difference um, between the, um, the CAPS ensemble. This is from uh, Hazardous Weather Test Fed um, 2010, many, you know, <laughs> many moons ago. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the reason why there's um, a lot of symmetric difference um, uh, for this particular model could be that it's just an over forecast of area because the centroid distances are, are pretty um, well 
um, established so that they must be fairly well co-located. However, if you look at this symmetric dis difference, um, you know, um, once again in, in this particular CAPS ensemble, um, and the centroid dis dis differences are um, much more di diverse, that could possibly mean that um, at this time there's more of a displacement error that's occurring, that, that that's what's causing that symmet symmetric difference. So it's, it's just showing you how you can use some of the attributes to um, infer what is going on um, in your model. Okay, um, one last thing, sorry, a multivariate mode. Um, this is a, a new feature where you can pass in um, several different fields and wind up with a, a super object, in this case, um, uh, specific humidity, temperature gradient, and, and two meter wind direction, or 10 meter wind direction, were used to identify dry lines. Here's the um, configuration. Note that there is a specific, um, if you're working just with um, MET, there is a specific configuration file for multivariate mode or mode multivariate. Um, and so you, you want to work with that because what it, it then has is it has this, um, uh, excuse me, a multivar logic, which is, um, you know, uh, you have pound and then the, ob um, the field number um, and you can, you know, figure out how you want to group those. Um, the ampersand ampersand is intersection and then the pipe pipe is union. So in this case, we want the intersection between, um, uh, if we go back to it, we want the intersection between specific humidity, temperature gradient, and um, 10 meter wind direction. Um, another way you could, um, you know, formulate that, it could be that you would want to have the intersection between specific humidity and um, temperature gradient. Um, and then you want the, um, the uh, union between that intersected field and the, the 10 meter winds. So that's um, what you would uh, use here. Um, and then for the forecast and observed fields, um, uh, you would have to have your, your field definitions. Um, and, and so you would have, um, in this case, number one would be alpha, number two would be beta, and number three is gamma and so forth. And then after that, um, most of the configuration file um, looks the same. Okay, so um, I just want to point out that there's um, lots of other examples of, of what you may want to apply mode to and how you may want to do analysis. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll just leave it with that. And I'm going to take questions while we are um, handing the, the screen over to Minna. And my apologies for putting us 10 minutes behind. Um, questions? And Minna, I'm going to stop presenting. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yeah. Okay, okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> like, <laughs> the silence was scary. All right, so um, I'm gonna do the MET Plus use case for this, uh, for the mode, mode tool. And uh, as a reminder, I know you've been hearing this throughout the entire workshop. Uh, make sure your environment is set correctly. We haven't been doing these hands-ons for a while. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lead by example, and I'm going to go ahead and make sure that I've set up my environment, and I'll verify by making sure that my MET build base is set, and it is. So, um, so everything is all fine and good. And then I'm going to go ahead and skip over to this section for the use case and i'm going to go ahead and open up this configuration file oops and you can take a look at uh, when it finally does come up there it is. And so you can just take a quick look and we, you can see that a lot of these settings correspond to what Tara was showing you in the, for the mode, mode config, uh, the, the MET config file. So um, for instance, we want to highlight this. Uh, what I wanted to point out um, is that you'll notice that we'll use these uh, variable names in, in um, curly braces. And that's because these are, are uh, 
config variables that are defined in other config files. So just as a reminder, when you see these, don't freak out. Remember, you've got um, uh, these de defined in another config file. But uh, very quickly, you can take a really quick quick look and see that some of these uh, things are, uh, some of these uh, values are set or have a correspondence to what you saw in the met config file. And so let's go ahead and make sure uh, we are in the correct tutorial directory. So I'm cheating and I'm copying and pasting. And I am in my MET Plus tutorial directory. And then I'm going to go ahead and just copy and paste because I've set up my environment properly. I'm going to copy and paste this run command. And as you can see, it's running. And I'm looking for this MET Plus as successfully finished running. I'm going to go ahead and um, show you what you should see. So you are, you're going to see these output files. You'll see an, a NetCDF file, a PostScript file, and some text files. And um, let's go ahead and take a look at this. Oops. Man. I'm having a hard time typing today. My apologies. Let me come over here and do this. And you can see that this is just a um, regular text file. If you have um, some some way some way to view the PostScript file, you can view that as well. So I have ghost view. And I'm going to view this one. And this will take a little bit of time to render. Oh, all right. Um, yeah, it's not working. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and discuss some of these things that you, other things that you need to look at. Um, so we have log files as well that you can look at. And you can see that the log file has been created in the output directory that you specified in one of your config files. It's going to be in the mode logs directory and it has a timestamp. So definitely check your, your, your log files. And then as a final for completeness, it's always a good idea to take a look at your, your MET plus final config file. This is the config file that is actually, th this, this config file represents all of the settings um, that were collected from all of the default uh, configuration files and your, your, users, your user configuration files. So if something looks a little peculiar and you need to do some troubleshooting, it's best to look at this configuration file to see what things you set um, to, to uh, um, like I said, it's useful for, for doing any kind of troubleshooting and verification. And let's see, I think now um, that is it. Um, and I can't see any of the, the chat. So if anybody uh, needs, has any questions, feel free to just interject. All right. So um, there's just one question from, uh, uh, from the chat, which is a lot of the outputs in the ratios um, of the lower value to the higher value, um, regardless of odds or forecasts. Is that correct? So, um, for uh, for things, for example, for area ratio um, in the past, the area ratio was um, you know they they put the um, the uh, larger value on on the bottom. Um, you know, the mode put the larger value on the bottom from um, to make it more robust from an engineering perspective, but we have changed that. So the output in the mode um, uh, file uh, now has forecast on top, uh, OBS um, on the bottom, regardless of whether it's the larger or smaller values. So hopefully that answers your question, Wes. And, and that was that was enacted in, in um, 
MET 10.0, MET Plus um, 4.0. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so uh, we, we do have a, a, a couple more, um, you know, we have four more minutes possibly set aside. Um, I just want to make sure that, that we really do provide um, enough time for questions on mode because now we're going to jump into mode time domain. So, um, you know, the, the object definition and so forth uh, is, is basically the same. Um, and then Dan wants to talk about how, how we're following things through time. So, um, what you would do with the mode output um, once it, once you have um, have written it out, and I, I haven't, I, I we didn't cover this, but um, there are PostScript files, as as Minna pointed out, that they um, provide the information about all the attributes. There's NetCDF, um, which provides the actual mode objects um, in the boundaries and and so forth. Um, and then there's ASCII output um, that provides um, information about the um, about the attributes, um, and that can be um, put into a database and used either with MetViewer or MetExpress. That was demonstrated a couple weeks ago. Um, there is also a mode analysis tool that does some some basic um, analysis as well. And it looks like Mena, you were able to to bring up the PDF now. Yes, correct. My apologies. I was in the wrong directory. So, of course, it's not going to find it. Um, so, yes, I'm just scrolling through. So, what you'll see when you open it up the PostScript file, there are multiple pages. And so, you can scroll through and look at um, all the information that you get. So, I'm just going to scroll through really, really slowly. So, you can take a quick look at the forecast, the observation. And then, uh, I can't fit all of this in one but yeah so um so this is what your out your your postscript file is going to generate so it's going to have some really useful graphics and um, tables that it produces for you okay okay um wes is also asking can you go over the convolution parameters again in the config file. Um, uh, so in the interest of time, why don't we see um, how far we get with mode time domain and we can circle back to that if, if we do have time with us. Otherwise we can, if you want, we can have a, a individual conversation. So, um, Dan, I guess, do you want to demonstrate uh, mode time domain? Sure. Um, my guess is we'll have some time to revisit the uh, config file, but um, we'll see how far we get. Um, okay, so is that full screen for everyone? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, as Tara mentioned, uh, I'm just going to talk about the uh, time component uh, that was added to mode uh, via the mode time domain uh, or MTD uh, tool within that. Um, and a lot of what Tara covered is going to apply here. and um, there's a lot of crossover um, from mode in this tool. Um, that's important to, to recall as well. Um, again, like Tara showed, this is just a, the, the MET wire diagram or roadmap, I like to call it sometimes. Um, I've added these uh, magenta or pink uh, oval and circle to just indicate that um, in some manner, you need to arrive at gridded data. Um, before you you use the mode time domain tool or mode tool um, since they they work on uh, two-dimensional uh, gridded data sets so what is mode time domain um, in a nutshell it, it adds a time dimension to object-based analysis that that um, is available in mode um, and the functionality is is to simply just read in several planes of data for each time step and convolve in both space uh, and that's x y uh, and the time dimension. So Tara covered the convolution um, that occurs within MET in the XY direction. This uh, time component adds a third dimension uh, to be able to convolve across. Um, again, like I mentioned on the previous slide, it reads various gridded data formats uh, and writes to a mode ASCII um, net CDF formatted output. 
Uh, a few notes, um, there's really no limit to the number of time steps um, that you can use. Um, so if you have a simulation or something out to 60 hours or out to one year, you know, or something like that every, every day. Um, but you, you should consider that the time steps uh, must be short enough for your objects to be able to overlap for the convolution to be effective. Um, and also note that um, because there's a third dimension here in time, there is increased data and therefore the speed of the convolution that is occurring in the software um, will, will go down. Um, so it might take a little bit uh, longer to run MT compared to just an XY object application. Um, mode time domain, uh, there's two differences I wanted to point out from mode that Tara talked about. The uh, convolution filter used inside mode time domain is square in shape instead of circular. Um, and unlike mode, um, there's no bad data allowed to be within the convolution uh, shape uh, for objects. Um, and graphing theory is used for matching and merging in, in, in objects between fields and Tara sort of went over this uh, previously. So what does this look like visually? This is about the, the simplest uh, sort of um, uh, mathematical uh, graphical representation you can make of this. Um, at the bottom of the stack here, uh, you're at time zero, and then time increases by one unit as you go vertically. And at each time, the XY dimension is shown with the blue lines, and the uh, object's path is, is the green dashed line, and the object itself is the red circle or dot. And you can see as we move from time zero at the bottom of the stack to time three, the object traverses its path, um, and there are certain things about that path that are meaningful for MTD analysis. So um, we'll talk a little bit about um, object interpretation um, for mode time domain. Um, this graphic is a little bit busy, but I'll try to walk us through it here. Um, as we looked at on the previous slide, um, the time dimension adds a vertical uh, dimension in the three-dimensional space. And I like to refer to these as slices or pancakes um, in the stack. Um, one pancake or slice is one time. Um, and each, in this diagram here, each of the stacks or, or pancakes is an equal width, equal to your time step. Um, the shading of the objects in the stack coming out of the map um, indicates a, a uh, you know, sort of geographical progression of the object where cooler colors um, are further west and warmer colors are to, towards the east in this particular reference frame. Um, and then the T-DIM um, over Northern California on the left side of the map uh, comes vertically out of the map. Um, and that's the time uh, axis and, and is what the objects evolve along. So each object, um, or excuse me, the objects that are anchored uh, to the map. So if you have a, a pancake or a time slice that is actually on the map, and this graph is a little hard to tell, uh, but I believe objects one and two here um, have a time slice that starts at, at T0. So that means an object was found at T0 um, uh, yeah, for those two particular objects, whereas the objects three and four you see um, we don't define objects based on our thresholds until later on in the simulation. Um, in this particular example, um, the longest duration object is object two, um, and the shortest duration is object three. Um, some other items to note here. Um, you can see that uh, from, I determined the, the duration by just looking at the time steps when the object appears. Um, so for example, we'll take object three, which first appeared at uh, T15 or time step 15 um, and was found uh, last at time step 23. Um, so you can kind of see how this looks in, in sort of X, Y, T space, which is a little bit different than X, Y, Z. Um, and uh, when objects sort of appear and, and end in the, the time dimension of the simulation. Um, maybe Tar or somebody else can say, um, is there a MET tool that creates this, this visualization from your forecast or OBS data set when you're running MTD? I can't recall. Uh, unfortunately, we, we do not provide any um, plotting um, support at this time for MTD. Um, it's, you know, 
users need to to um, develop their own, you know, we recommend using something like Python or, or um, something like that. We do have some custom in-house um, plotting, is which is what this was generated with, but it's uh, we've never been able to package it in a way that um, you know we can support it to the community. So if if you're interested in the customized software, um, you know, can you can reach out via GitHub discussions, but uh, and we, and we can provide it to you, but we're not going to be able to provide too much you know in-depth support on it. Yeah, um, I wanted to add something else. Mike Erickson from NOAA has some plotting in Python that is currently just living right now in our MetPlotPy repository. And so um, you can reach out. Sorry, Mike, if I'm volunteering you. Uh, you can reach out to Mike Erickson if you if you need some assistance on that. No worries. I'm happy. Yeah, happy to provide guidance on that. Great. It's glad to hear something's already in that plot pie unofficially because I was going to also suggest that we would accept um, user submissions of, of that sort as well, I would imagine, to, to novel yes. ways of visualizing this output. So um, anyone yes. out there who's who has a has something that they'd be willing to share or thinks it would be interested in the community, um, feel free to reach out. Okay, um, so when you define these um, objects in MTD, you can uh, you can obtain attributes about them, just like mode. Um, and so here, there's just three attributes I'll point out. Uh, so you have this object, which is the green shaded area um, evolving um, through time. And the duration is simply just the, the time end uh, minus the time start. Um, and you can also obtain uh, the centroid of the object in 3D XYT space, um, as well as a velocity. Uh, which is done by um, fitting a line um, through the center of the attribute or the uh, the object. Excuse me. So let's take a look at a, a real world example. Um, again, more on the visual side to sort of sort of highlight how this is working. So on the upper left, um, there's a four panel uh, shaded contour on the top row and um, two dimensional uh, mode object uh, uh, plots on the on the bottom panel. Um, and the left column is a forecast, uh, and the right column is the observation. This is a sea level, mean sea level pressure, um, and the objects defined here are anticyclones or high pressure regions um, with a threshold of uh, greater than or equal to 1,025 hectopascals. Um, this particular simulation, I'm just showing one time um, in the upper left from mode, uh, went out to 240 hours every six hours. So that gives you 40 times um, in your total simulation. So if you think about it again as a stack of pancakes or whatever, you could have um, you know an object appear at T0 all the way through uh, T40. So you'd have this huge stack of um, you know anticyclonic uh, objects uh, vertically um, through time um, and space. And uh, certainly we can see that a little bit if you switch from looking at a single mode. Uh, uh, snapshot in the upper left to looking at all 240 hours of your simulation um, in the X, Y, and then also the T dimension uh, coming out of the map here um, with these stacks of objects. Uh, similar to the earlier example, in this particular example, um, cooler colors are when objects are further to the west, and uh, the warmer colors are objects further to the east. So you can see um, Greenland, you know, prime meridian, uh, sort of areas are sort of green or neutral. That's like the middle of the domain because the domain is global. Whereas um, the southern hemispheric objects over in Australia um, and, and such are warmer, um, and those are farther to the uh, to the east. Um, and the analysis and forecast are shown uh, side by side or on top of each other here to kind of compare uh, where MTD was identifying these uh, anticyclonic regions through time and in space. So if we take that MTD example and look at the different attributes that MTD uh, provided, um, here I've just uh, circled uh, two objects, um, uh, object four from the forecast data set and object three from the analysis data set, which are uh, geographically and temporally um, similar. And here you can see the maximum intensity um, for the forecast object was 1,039 hectopascals. Uh, the analysis object was also 1,039. Um, you see the volume comparison, the centroid, 
um, and then also the velocity of that object um, through time and space. So you can see how it obtains um, these different attributes about the, the objects um, with the added time dimension. So I, I thought it was useful to sort of compare uh, different things you can get from mode um, in the two-dimensional space with, uh, as opposed to mode time domain when you add the third time dimension. I'm not going to go through all of these, but um, you know, I, I thought it was useful to put this here for reference uh, because uh, it, it's nice to just see the difference between the two um, side by side. So we'll move into usage um, of the tool. It's fairly straightforward. Um, you can call MTD. Um, that's the name of the command um, from the MET software package. Dash forecast is the list um, of fi forecast files, uh, space separated or a file list or a single file. And then uh, dash obs is the corresponding um, obs data that you want to match up to your forecast time um, provided with dash forecast. Um, you can do dash single, which uh, provides a single two dimensional field um, to, to define objects with a config file and some optional uh, typical met, uh, commands. Uh, a brief uh, discussion about some um, mode time domain config options that are unique to the time aspect of mode. Um, that might differ from, from mode itself. Um, I just wanted to highlight our, our conv time window. So uh, similar to what Tara mentioned um, in, in her slides on the convolution step, we're sort of smoothing out uh, things a little bit to be able to uh, better define objects. And so and when we've added this time dimension, we allow smoothing in that dimension as well. Um, the default is to do one time step before to one time step after. So it's sort of just a, you know, like a moving uh, window uh, through time. Um, I also point out min volume. Uh, I believe this also exists in mode. So I'm gonna jump in if, if, if I have that wrong, but um, the min volume is the, the minimum volume you want your object to have uh, in order to be uh, classified as an object. But I wanna point out here that um, because we've added a time dimension, um, these values can get very large. Um, so having a min uh, volume of uh, too low when you're using MTD or, or if you take your min volume you're using with mode and try to use it in MTD, it might be too small. You might end up with a ton of objects um, because, uh, you know, even with 10 time steps, your volume will be 10 times, um, you know, what it would be with, with just uh, X, Y objects. Um, and again, I noted down below, uh, feel free to refer to Tara's slides or the MET um, a user guide uh, for more information about uh, object-based uh, configuration in mode and mode time domain. Um, here's an example of running it. Um, so here I just have three arbitrary forecast scripts files and three arbitrary um, observation files paired up with my config file, um, and then a list of the types of outputs um, that come out um, of MTD. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them here again for time purposes, and I've included a link um, because the Met User Guide has a fantastic um, tabular presentation um, of the column names uh, and what each column means in the ASCII output from MTD. So I would refer all of you to that um, resource to um, sort of get familiar with the types of things uh, that MTD produces in the output, which are a lot of things having to do with the attributes of objects. Um, and other things like that. So just a quick summary, um, adds a time dimension, uh, MTD adds time dimension to object-based verification, um, for example, mode. Um, it's really powerful and has lots of configurability, just like the mode tool. And I've just shown a couple other examples of a probabilistic, defining probabilistic objects, um, and also a really, really, really long uh, climate type simulation on the right. Um, so here our stack of proverbial pancakes is now almost indistinguishable because there are so many vertical slices um, because of the number of time steps in the simulation. So uh, just to highlight um, you know, how, how long uh, of the time dimension can really be in some of these uh, applications. So I'll end there um, to try and leave some time uh, for some questions <laughs> if there is any, and um, I'd be happy to, to try and answer any if, if folks have some. Thank you.
I just wanted to call your attention to, I put a link to the Metplotpy repository where Mike Erickson's plots are located. And my apologies for misspelling your name, Mike. And um, do we have time to do the hands-on, just the real quick for the use case? Uh, are there any quick questions that want to, that someone wants to ask? Okay, barring none, um, I do want to point out, I just put into the chat the link to the call for abstracts for the um, MetPlus workshop. Um, it's, you know, hooked into the, the MetPlus workshop page, but I, I'm linking directly to that. And with that, maybe Minna just run through one example. Okay. So I'm going to follow this um, example in the, uh, in the doc online documentation. So um, just to, to, to reinforce what Dan showed, um, we have uh, the, the, a pretty, pretty straightforward configuration file that the, the wrapper has that wraps around all of those uh, configuration settings that he pointed out in the MET tool. And then, um, you know, we just wanted to point out that, you know, you can set your radius threshold, et cetera, in, in your MET plus wrapper configuration file. I'm already in the MET plus tutorial directory, so I'm just going to very quickly, hopefully, run literally run the um, example and it has uh, it has successfully finished and what you'll see, what you should see are the following these following six uh, um, output files now in the proper directory so let me actually go to the correct directory and show you that indeed I am not lying that you will see those you'll see um, this uh, net CDF file um, and then the, the other text files um, as a result. Um, if you want to, you can do an NC view on that and see what that, that file looks like. Um, you need to actually come into your NC view uh, GUI and pick the variable that you want to look at. So um, not too terribly interesting right now, uh, but it, it might prove uh, interesting for you. Um, and then, uh, you know, you can take a look at one of these uh, output text files as well and see what, what's going on. And then again, to reinforce, there's a log file that's generated and a MetPlus final config file that you can always refer to that collects all of the, the final configuration settings that were applied for running the tool. Okay, so that it was a whirlwind um, exam, uh, hands-on. And then that we also have some extra um, additional examples that you can run through on your own if you so desire. Thank you, Minna, for that whirlwind tour of, of both mode and mode time domain. Um, you know, the examples that we have there run very quickly. Uh, mode and mode time domain can be um, very computationally expensive if you're um, trying to identify a lot of objects in a field. Once again, if you're looking on the convective scales or something like that, um, you know, the, it, it may take a little bit longer because it has to go through and, and identify all those objects and then do the matching, you know, between each one of those objects. Um, so uh, if you do run into long run times, um, maybe consider, uh, you know, changing your configuration to, to make sure that your objects are a little bit smaller, or excuse me, um, you have less objects. Um, maybe uh, changing the minimum size um, for objects that you're looking at and so forth. So um, any last questions on mode time domain? Unfortunately, Wes, I don't know that we have time to go back over the um, convolution parameters again um, today. Uh, maybe we can uh, maybe put that into um, the FAQs, into the questions and, and um, the Q&A session that we're having on May 10th, and we can go over it there. Um, and then Mike Erickson did actually um, say that he, uh, he may be updating the repository that uh, Minna pointed um, everyone to um, early this summer. So um, just know that it might be changing. Okay, um, with that, we... 
this is the conclusion of um, our first suite of um, Met Plus training. We are looking at starting an advanced um, series uh, probably in the fall. Um, and then we do have the, the Met Plus Users Workshop uh, the 27th through the 29th of June. Um, and uh, as I said, I just put the, the call for um, the abstracts uh, out um, on the chat here. Um, I'll also include it in our follow-up email um, once the recording of the session has been posted. Um, and with that, I just want to say thank you to everyone who has, um, you know, uh, routinely participated in the training series. We hope this has been helpful. And um, we will be soliciting ideas for um, what we want to um, tackle for advanced training um, in the fall. So thank you so much and have a great time playing around with MetPlus. <laughs>